economic equality matters. It seems a bit ironic now after the budget where we have a lot of cuts on some of the lowest income groups in society and in services for low income groups. But I still think that I, I, it is extremely important. Then I will talk about what we can do in education, because I think that's very important. There are things, the problem of equality is partly in education and economics affects a lot, but there's a lot we can do within education. So I want to talk about I, I, I'm a believer, like um, you're a very, very great, great uh, famous uh, philosopher in Oxford uh, who wrote a book on equality. And he used to say that he gave the same lecture to the minors as he gave to the university. Well, I hold the same view. Everybody is an intellectual. You may not have the function of an intellectual, but everybody is an intellectual. And I am not going to give you a different lecture to what I've given you, City. I'm giving you the same lecture, because you will understand this, because you are an intellectual. And there are three ways in which we look at equality. <laughs> Basically, the first one is that all people are of equal worth. The whole world, virtually, not every country, subscribe to that. It's very basic. Freedom from torture, freedom from humiliation. The very basic view of the right to life. The second concept is the one that dominates Irish thinking. Liberal equal opportunities policy. That you have the right to compete for goods. And most of the Education Act that governs education in this country is built on that, 1998. This idea that you have equal formal rights. No one will stop you and say you can't go to the university. Nobody says you can't go to uh, have um, a, a further degree. But the reality is, if you don't have money and resources, you won't be able to get it. So you have a formal legal right, but you often don't have the means to realize that right. And that's a huge problem in this country. You know, we have a lot of equal formal rights. You have a formal right to health care, but you can be told two years before you get your hip replacement. You have a formal right to transport as old persons. In the country, as my mother always says, who lives in West Clare, I have a right to public transport, and there is no public transport. So we have equal formal rights is only about having no legal prohibitions on you from doing something. That's what it means, and that is what governs the laws in this country in terms of equality in education. But our view is that we need to have equality of condition which is that people, groups and individuals have all got equal prospects for a good life. Not just that you have the right, but that you have the means to realize your right. That's very important. So I want to talk about this and what it means for education. So what I'm saying here <coughs> is when people tell you, oh, there's equality of opportunity in Ireland, and I'd say equality of opportunity is about making sure the rules of the game are fair for distributing goods and privileges. It's about, we often say, the equal right to compete and to fail. Because there is no question about it. We have a, a, a student of mine did her thesis on, she lives in Wicklow actually, and with a number of young people who left school, and, and including a number of her own family in their school early. That's what motivated her to do it. And one of them said something that I thought was very telling about this first point. They said, well, some people are on the yachts and some people are on the life rafts. And we're on the right life rafts, so why should we bother? And that is the problem. When we have a huge inequalities in society, uh, young, many young people drop out of school because they know they can't compete. They don't need a degree to tell them that if you have a fee-paying school in Dublin or up the road that has 10 times more resources than your school, you are going to be more advantaged. I remember my son, when he was in a, big, a public school in Dublin, said to me, they have even got better quality footballs than we have. And I thought that said a lot. They have better quality footballs. So I think that that is, it accepts, liberalism accepts that inequality of some kind is inevitable. But equality of condition does not. It is about eliminating major hierarchies of wealth, power, and privilege. And it doesn't accept the inevitability. And I think that people forget, people say, oh, it will be always there. I don't accept that. In 1960, there was a report written in this country, which you, that may seem very long ago to you, but I was alive in 1960, I was a child. 
And the, the report said that the majority of people in Ireland would never benefit from second level education, second level, because they weren't intelligent enough. And that was the report of the Commission on Education in 1960. Can you ever think of such a dreadful low expectation? But it has changed, and we now have 60% of people in higher education. So we can create different conditions, and we can create more opportunities. We can have great expectations. And let me show you countries. This is um, a very important, if you can't see it, I'm going to give you these if you want them, but this is a very important table. This is, there are major studies done now showing the more economically unequal a country is and the worse all its social problems are. These are done by two professors of medicine in Britain uh, uh, that are there, but they have included, it's a study of rich countries. And down in the bottom line here, <coughs> you have low income inequality, high income inequality. You can see the United States is up at the top. And this side here is social problems. Worse social problems, low social problems. And these are low life expectancy, low maths and literacy attainment, high infant mortality, high rates of murder, high rates of imprisonment, unwanted teenage births, not just teenage births, unwanted. Low levels of trust, high levels of obesity, high levels of mental illness, and drug addiction, and alcohol addiction, and low social mobility. The United States is an extremely wealthy country, but it remains the most unequal of the rich countries in the world. It also has a higher rate of imprisonment now than China, per capita, and a huge murder rate. And the point, Portugal is also the most unequal country actually in Europe. A lot of people don't realize that economically. And Britain is next. You see, Ireland is here. We're in the upper quadrant. Greece, Ireland, we're up this side. We're, we're always classified as being part of the Anglo zone. We're part of the Anglo-American zone, unfortunately, in my view. Down here, you have the Northern European countries, the most economically equal and the best health the low, best maths and literacy, lowest infant mortality, lowest imprisonment, I can go on, lowest obesity. So, and, and actually Japan, a lot of people don't realize that after the last war, Japan had a policy of a maximum and minimum income in all companies. It had, and it still has the retention of that, and that led to huge <coughs> economic stability for many years. I know it has its economic problems on and off, but it is it remains a country with very high life expectancy and very low social problems. So economic equality is hugely important for education as well. And that's what I want to talk about because that, that map alone says more than a thousand words. It shows you that if you, even if you have a very wealthy country, they like Britain, and Britain, and unfortunately we follow Britain so much, so often. Britain is one of the most unequal countries now in Europe, and in my view, it is not the model to follow. We should follow the Northern European model, like Norway, Sweden, Finland, those countries in Europe. And, and what I'm saying here is, inequality is always relational. You're always unequal or more equal relative to others. And in an unequal society, what education becomes, it's about a competitive advantage. I want to get more points than you. I want to get into that course. And that becomes very urgent in economically unequal societies. I was a visiting professor last year in Sweden. And what fascinates me, I was there when their public exams were going on. You've none of the hype you have here about the legal cert, none of it. And part of it is that people know there is a state security. There is a proper welfare state. Yes, it has moved to the right, Sweden has moved to the right by comparison to what it was, but you have a huge infrastructure of childcare, welfare, security, uh, second chance education. So people don't get as anxious about, as it were, getting into further higher education first time round, because they know there is security. And that's what I mean, that if you have a, a hugely unequal society, Everybody is fighting to make sure that their child or themselves is not at the bottom. And that's really what makes inequality so invidious. Everybody is fighting to maintain their own position. And it's very divisive, of course, because it breaks up solidarity. People often say about Ireland, why we don't have solidarity or support, but 
if you create, as we have created over the Celtic Tiger years, huge uh, wealth inequalities, nobody wants their child to be the person who is in McDonald's doing the casual shift <coughs> with no pension and no security. That's the truth. They might put up a gloss, they like it, but people don't want that. They want economic security. They want to know that they'll be able to pay their way in life and whatever it is, and maybe when they're older, have a pension. So what I'm saying here is education, social mobility is about who gets on in education across generations. And now not all countries are in this because they only analysed a few. But in again here, uh, does education lead to greater opportunity? No, it certainly does not in the United States, relatively speaking. But it does in the more equal countries. Economically equal countries have greater social mobility. Norway, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, Canada, and Germany as you come down. And then down at the bottom are the two countries that we model ourselves on, the UK and the United States. The last countries in the world to model yourself on in terms of health and well-being and in terms of opportunities in education. So that's why I want to move on and to say, so it matters. <coughs> Whether we like it or not, social class, and that can take different forms, but we'll come to that at the end, inequalities remain the major factor that impact on education participation. And this second point I make here, I know my son gave out to me, he said, you have too many words in those slides. He said, nobody would be bothered reading them. But anyway, I need it, and forgive me. But it's an important point. The higher the level of equality in society, the higher the level of anxiety. That actually, people sometimes people forget. Uh, fear, fear of failing, fear for the future. And that propels people to be more competitive and to seek out competitive uh, advantage in private markets for their own children. That is actually what happens. If you have economic insecurity, everybody becomes more vicious. And that's a fact, whether we like it or not. Uh, so if we create an unequal society, we break up solidarity. And people have what I call the anxious classes, the middle classes. The ones who are afraid they're going to lose what they have. They are afraid and uncertain of the future. And there has been, to use the word for Marx, proletarianization, which means that middle class people are increasingly working class. They're increasingly without pensions and without security. And I am astounded, and I mean astounded at the extent to which people have said, oh, these people with pensions is dreadful. I would like to say we are going to have massive poverty in the next generation in their old age unless somebody does something about pensions. Massive poverty. Because Pensions are crucial with life expectancy. Life expectancy now in Ireland is up to 80 years of age. We're moving over that. What are people going to do if they have no pensions? It's a very serious problem. So I'm saying equality of economic conditions matters in education because if, if, if you have a huge inequalities, people will fight to maintain advantage, grants for their own children, uh, take them out of schools, make sure that they're in the top street to help with everybody else. And there are five limitations, therefore, to inequality of opportunity. Yeah, this view, this liberal view that dominates thinking in Ireland. It ignores qualities and life conditions between competitors. As I said, as one young person said to me in an interview, I don't see any point in staying in school to do my legal cert because I'm not going to compete in a game where the same team always wins. That's it. And when people say young people drop out, I'm much more... I'm not agreeing with people leaving school early, but I understand why people leave early. If I was failing at something, and I was down in the bottom stream, and I didn't feel that anybody was that interested in me, I would leave, psychologically, for my own well-being. And I think that people forget that. It's an unpopular thing to say, but that is how people feel psychologically. So we have got to ensure that if people stay in school, that there are real opportunities for people, not that you are, as it were, at the bottom of the heap and there's nowhere for you to go. The other point is, and this is very important, people say, oh, well, I'm from a work class area, or I'm from the west of Ireland, and I got on. So if you worked hard, you could get on. Well, that, unfortunately, is one of the great myths of liberalism, because it has always been that a small number of people from minority groups, a small number of travellers, a small number of people who are disabled, a small number from working class communities do get up and do achieve. 
But the whole system is designed to maintain class advantage. I mean, there are so many things that have been done in higher education in particular that I think are disgraceful, actually. And I said this in the university, so I'm not saying it out of court. I mean, the whole, I believe, for example, for a lot of the so-called professions, there should be random selection in points. Random selection. Why should people with higher points? Uh, when you go into the colleges now of higher education, many of them give scholarships to high point students. I'm vehemently opposed to that. Because we know the students disproportionately in their high points is to do with their social class background. It isn't to do with their capabilities. And I want to say that here because one of the things I first wrote about in life was a critique of the concept of human intelligence. There is no such thing as people being unintelligent. There is no such thing. And if anybody tells you you're a child or yourself, you're not intelligent, that is one of the myths of the 19th century eugenics movement. Everybody's intelligent, but everybody, as I said to you, you are all intellectuals, even if you don't have the life of living an intellectual, you are all intelligent people, even if you don't have had the opportunity to develop that intelligence. But I'm just saying, a lot of people, uh, in one or two generations, class, we know that class inequalities are maintained in this country, and we need uh, the professions themselves have played a central role in that. Medicine lately, for example, has introduced this health professional aptitude test. That is grossly discriminatory. Grossly discriminatory. Gender discriminatory because it was designed to exclude women, but it's also class discriminatory because it was designed to, it costs money to do it, you can only do it on one day, you have to do preparation tests for it that you have to pay for privately. It's about excluding a working class people in the world. That's primarily, I'm sorry, that is what it's about. The other thing is, when you have this culture of, oh, if you're intelligent, you get on. Such a lot of folk. Uh, if, if people, a lot of people do not get on with life because they don't have opportunities, or they, maybe they don't even have the opportunities to develop the types of vocabulary or mathematics at a young age that you need to get on. But what happens is, instead of people saying, well, I didn't have that, they start to blame themselves. They say, well, I, in fact, in our outreach program, people often say to me, oh, well, you know, I'm no good now at school. That's the first thing I hear. Well, I say, well, now we discount that. We just eliminate that. That's rubbish. You may have learned that, but that's not true. You may have not had the opportunity, maybe to work, maybe you were sick, maybe your family didn't know the importance of education, but you are an intelligent person. But unfortunately, in this liberal model, people tend to blame themselves. <coughs> And as I said, it problematizes the dominant, rather than, oh sorry, I meant to say the dominant at the end there. When we talk about equality in education, we say, oh, what do we do for the working class? And what do we do for the poor? Or what do we do for travelers or people who drop off? Well, I would like to turn that around and say, what privileges have we put in place for people who are already privileged? Why are we still funding the fee paying schools? Why are they allowed to select? I know they've introduced an increase in the teacher approval ratio of those schools, but that's a relatively minor issue and uh, 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 change. So I'm just saying, if you want to bring about change, uh, we have to address finally, uh, look at the powerful and how the powerful actually exclude other people and what they do to achieve that and how the state endorses that practice, how the state actually allows it to happen. And indeed, the university is another place of higher education. And, <coughs> the, and as I said, equal opportunities policy alone can't address structural inequalities. They redistribute privileges and justice. So you have a small number of women who won't see your posts, or a small number of travelers, or a small number of disabled people, etc. So I'm saying we do have to look at the structural conditions. That is now, and I'm going to want to say that of course that doesn't mean we can't do things. Because of course we can do things. Let's look at what we can do. The state can reduce economic inequality by having progressive and less regressive taxes. That is very important for education. The reason it is is because simply being able to go to education and avail of it does depend on money. And as I said, the social partners and others have to accept that. I mean, I am a high paid person. I pay a lot of tax. I believe, for example, the government were wrong. I think that people like us should have been taxed higher. And many people like me believe that. They should not have cut uh, book cuts, for example, on the drugs and and things like that. Because they affect the lowest income of people in society. But, and that reflects the fact that I think our political parties of every persuasion in the state have lost any moral purpose. They've lost their sense of moral purpose. They're there to lead, not just to get re-elected as a party. 
I just find it so depressing. But anyway. <laughs> so I think we need to increase expenditure on public education. And I am really worried about something that has happened yesterday. People probably haven't even noticed it. It's to take away the maintenance funds from postgraduate students, from low-income postgraduate students. Mm -hmm. That is really serious. Very, very serious. Because that means the students who are eligible to get grants at that level tend to be students from low-income families, and it would seriously disadvantage them, especially mature students returning to education. It's a huge injustice. Another thing that I think could be done, we should have sanctions for schools that discriminate against minorities. Real sanctions, economic sanctions. I'm sorry, I don't see if you have worked it out so that you don't have any students uh, with disabilities in your school, or you don't take any travelers, I'd like to know how you manage it. And therefore, I think there should be sanctions, or alternatively, there should be mass financial incentives for people who have, I uh, know there are some, but I still think it should be far greater. I also think, by the way, the teachers who work in schools where there are huge social problem issues and people need extra support should be better resourced. I can't believe that. I know it's not a very popular view, but I do like that. Because then you have a huge problem in the country of people, traditionally maybe not now because of unemployment, of people moving or were excellent teachers often moving out of their schools, certainly in the Dublin area, and moving away from what they would call difficult school to teach. So it's very important that you incentivize those people to stay where they are. So that's something else that can be done. I think that the social education partners need to review their own role in upholding economic and an unequal economic and education system. I'm a trade union member all my life, member of SIPTU, and I am extremely critical of the unions. I think that much of their time uh, it has been meant, uh, you know, in the post-war era, there was a, a settlement, if you like, between capital and labor. And the settlement was that you would have a highly differentiated wage and salary system. And <coughs> going back to Japan, and it's about four and five to one income, maximum to minimum income, I believe we should have that in education and we should have it in society. I was visiting Montreal, I don't know if any of you have heard of it, in northern Spain lately, the most successful cooperatives in the world, employ 83,000 people, 120 cooperatives. They have maximum and minimum income. They're around since the 1940s. They're the only region, the Basque region in northern Spain, to have almost, well, they have 10% unemployment, when the unemployment in Spain is 22%. And they have virtually no unemployment among young people. Because the last thing they do with the co-ops is to let somebody go because they are not about making money for private companies, they are about maintaining jobs. So I think we need alternative models here. I'm asking, when have the trade unions invested money in alternative economic models? Looking at alternative models. Have they done anything about popular education? Where are the circles of learning that Freire developed in Brazil? Why are the trade unions used to do that in the 1930s and 40s in Britain? They used a popular education circle to educate people who worked in school, to educate people to resist, to mobilize, to organize. So I'm asking them, what do they do? Because they're wealthy in it. I'm sorry, that's a fact. They are well off. And <coughs> I think we should review the intelligence and cognitive skills tested in national examinations. This may seem very remote for you, but I think it's extremely significant. Uh, we still rely in we, all our major exams in testing in language and mathematics largely, linguistic and mathematical intelligences. Whereas I know that in life, and anybody who works with anybody knows, that personal intelligences, your ability to get on with people, understand yourself, your social skills, your sense of humor, uh, your, uh, your ability to do many things in music and the arts, variety of areas of life, matter an awful lot. But we don't assess or provide space for those skills to be appraised in our education systems. So, of course, what happens is we screen out an awful lot of people who are highly advanced in skills in those areas, and we only allow those on who have already acquired the mathematical and other skills that are assessed in schools. The last time we assessed of the skills assessed in the Leaving Cert was 1970. Can you believe it? And I would say there are a lot, I would also argue that we should have the same in higher education, by the way. Because I think increasingly that has become involved in road journey. And I think we need investment in research. Ireland, in case you might be aware of this, 
96% of money for research in this country goes to at the science, technology, and related area. There is only 4% goes to the arts, humanities, and social sciences. That is unbelievable by European standards. The next lowest country is Britain, where it's 7%. And people often say to me, why don't you have data about this? Why don't you have data? We can't have data because nobody funds it. The only funding we get now is from Europe. And honestly, I can tell you, Europe is not going to fund us to do research on Irish education. And of course, if you don't do research, you keep people ignorant. Mm. Don't underestimate it. The absence of it. For example, I have. 20 times, I'd say, I've written proposals to the Department of Education to say we should have a social class, gender, disability, you know, traveler identity, disability, etc., all those, yeah, ethnic minorities, uh, analysis of the leading search results. We have none. We have no one. We have no analysis of it. We have no analysis of junior search. Why? Nobody wants it politically. Oh, but why? Because what we would find out is there are huge inequalities year on year. And I think the lack of information is a way of controlling dissent. You keep people ignorant. You don't give them information. They can't say that the leaving cert, the travelers are only 2% are doing the leaving cert. You keep everybody in their place. And that is not accidental. That is deliberate, and it is a way of ensuring we do not have equality in education. So I'm saying we should collect data annually. We should have data on the junior cert. We should have data. I'm not asking for weak data, but I'm totally opposed to weak data. I'm talking about national data, which is based on individuals. You anonymize the data. It's very simple to do nowadays. And you know who and what areas of society are doing that. I'm not particularly interested in individual schools, because schools have no say often in who comes to them. And focusing on the school is the wrong issue, as far as I'm concerned. But we need to educate people. And this is another thing that's stopping now. Policy makers, I'm astounded to see these conferences happen. Because there are no conferences happening. There's no wind service. Everybody's decided that people don't need to be educated. But the truth is, you know, if you have no new ideas, if you don't come together to speak, your mind goes into dull mode. It's a fact of life. It's a very simple fact of life. Whether you're working in the community or you're childcare or whatever you're in, it doesn't matter. You need to be constantly educated. And I don't think in Ireland we have a tradition of that at all. We think, oh, you've done your degree, you've done your diploma, now you're finished. So that's very important to keep people aware and so that people can promote new ideas. And it's part, part of the problem I'm referring to is the anti-intellectualism of Irish life. There's a strong anti, oh, that one with her big ideas, and that fellow, sure you wouldn't know what he's talking about. Well, that's very dangerous thinking politically. Because it means that we don't allow ourselves to think differently and new ways of doing things. I feel very strongly about this. Probably the thing I most feel strongly about. If we want policy change, we have to have what a dialogue between the policy makers, the people working on the ground, the communities on the ground, academics, activists, everybody. What we call the politics of presence. Policies need to be designed by people, community groups, women's groups, in education policy making. And that is one of, the, to my mind, one of the major limitations of the 1998 Education Act. That it only includes the professionals and the managers of schools as social partners in education. I do not see how you could design a policy on education for children with autism, or travelers, or older people, uh, <coughs> for example, around the internet, without actually having them as major designers and uh, people planning that with you. I don't see how you could do that. We have a woman doing her PhD and master's with us from Google, a very senior woman at the moment. And she came into me and she said she had this great plan for the over 50s. They were all going to use the internet. Great, I said. Have you asked them? Do they want to? Do you know what the biggest problem for people from all over this country? She said, no. Well, I can tell you, I said, biggest problem is social isolation and loneliness. Mm -hmm. So when you go and ask them, and then go and design your policy, come back to me. But don't come to me with a policy that's going to have everybody going on Facebook at 75, when they have no interest in being on Facebook at 75. Yes, they do use Skype, but their children are all emigrating. Yes, they do use that. So I think that that's the point I'm making here about the politics of presence. And again, I'm saying to professionals, 
teachers, social workers, policy people at the top, we should reflect on our own inadequacy. We do not know what's good for people. We do not know if the ground up is how we learn on a daily basis. And I think I ask the question, why should professionals be just the people who design policy? I think that's why we have so many bad policies for young people, even school, etc. I take a very simple thing in school. Start, and I've said this a thousand times, survey every year in every class of what you think of your teacher. Very good. I can't see what's wrong with that. I have one every year. In fact, I've had a couple of times a year. Use your first name. I can't see my teacher can't be spoken to in the first name. Because once the day I have to use my title, the day if you have to call me doctor or professor, I know then I am living by my title. I am not living through my person, to you as another equal. So those are very simple things that professionals could do to change the way in which we relate to one another. Um, I, I feel a lot of these things. The voluntary contribution. This is not voluntary. It's involuntary, as anybody knows. But, I mean, why should the public education in primary school, especially, and in second level, be dependent on that? I have a lot of questions to ask about it. I would say the schools don't need it. And of course, you may have seen me as mentioning on the news one day about the fact that they now have the ludicrous situation that if you pay more than 250 euro in a voluntary contribution, the schools get tax relief. And for those schools, they can't, or parents who can't afford to pay that, there's no tax relief at all. So the schools that can get the higher voluntary contribution can get a top up from the state in the form of tax relief. I never heard anything that is so socially unjust. Um, the school books, that's another thing I want to comment on. Another unspoken issue in this country. Most people here with children know that they cost a fortune, an absolute fortune, even in primary school. I must be astounded. And then in second level, we have this system every year whereby uh, you know, they change three pages of the biology book and you have to buy a new book, even though your daughter or son has just done that. He was the other book last year. That is, shouldn't be allowed. I mean, there is no reason for that to be happening. There should be an inset if they want to introduce a new section. And you should be able to get it. I mean, no country in Europe has, in the main stream of older, if you like, states of Europe, uh, the 15 original states, none of them have it to people have to buy primary school. I, mean, I just I think that our parents in this country aren't even aware of how deeply unjust our education system is at that level. Um, national childcare. I believe there should be universal national childcare. Maybe a very mad thing to say it these days. I don't care about it, is it not? It is a huge issue. Until we have it, and until it's properly funded, uh, we know, for example, that there's an awful lot of talk about preschool education. Yes, it matters. But it isn't only there. We need childcare support so that people can actually be employed, so that women in particular can be economically independent, so when they get old, they will have pensions and security. It's very, very basic. And the other point I make here, I just put down that note to myself, lesson from the OA Health Chart. A lot of people say early childhood education is everything. It isn't, I'm sorry. If you read the studies that were done for 25 years in the United States, Early childhood education matters, but if you, there is no support into upper primary and upper second level, the gains are lost. So it isn't just if you, you know, it's a one soft thing and everything is hunky dory. That is not true. And there have been umpteen studies of that. It's very popular to say that now, and it's often used as a way to say we reduce funding to upper secondary or higher education. That's very, very dangerous thinking because we know that the gains of early childhood education can be lost. Second chance education, again, in this country, that is really first chance for a lot of people. And again here, we don't really have a, a sufficient concerted policy. I mean, I just, there really isn't great support for people who want to return to education. It's, it's cumbersome, it's awkward, it's often inaccessible, and it's costly. And again, I think it's deeply regrettable that this National Education Committee on Disadvantage was actually disbanded. And nobody created a fuss about it. Nobody did. And yet its whole purpose was to ensure that we had greater equality in education. Sorry. Um, another thing I talk about schools. I heard you say there are 22 schools in Wexford. 
Secondary. Um, there's a lot of discreet discrimination and exclusion by school. Very discreet and very systematic. And I think that there needs to be, I think there has been some discussion of this lately, but we used to have things like first come, first served. First come, first served is deeply discriminatory against people who move to the state, it's deeply discriminatory against people who have to move house, it's deeply discriminatory against travellers. It's, and of course, you have the other thing is the uh, children of past pupils. Another unbelievably discriminatory practice. Because, of course, the people who had to go to the more traditional secondary school and then in the first place, then their children can go there again. Why should they? They don't have an, an automatic and right entitlement to do that. Uh, I think in schools, there are things that can be done. We need actually quality policy in schools. In schools. And it was amazing, yesterday we had a very heated debate in my School of Social Justice because people wanted us to take unpaid interns. I said, I'm not taking any unpaid interns in this school because the only people who will be able to work on an unpaid basis are people who are middle class. Because who can afford to live on no money? No one can afford to live on no money unless your parents are supporting you. So what we do is we give a leg up by having an internship to people who are already privileged, and then they'd be better off again than the people who can't afford it because they have to work at the local cafe to survive. There's an awful lot of very, uh, in policy making, I think, in schools and that, we don't often think of how do we do it for people who are gay or lesbian in schools? What are we doing for disabled children? What policies have we? How does it work? Who's in charge of it? Who's driving it? How is it monitored? I think there's a lot of questions. If we're, and the issue of social class, of course, which remains completely silent in Ireland. It is an issue. People say we have no class. We most certainly have class. And where people know this is when they're getting married, where they send their children to school, or where they live. Then you know their social class. But we don't talk about it. And that's one of the reasons it controls people. Because if you don't talk about something, it controls you. The same way as the there's been a gay issue that wasn't spoken about, I never heard about it when I was at school, nor indeed for 30 years after I was at school, it wasn't spoken about. And then the bullying that you spoke about earlier on, all of those things can be sources of bullying. Children being called knackers. Children being called, you know, all kinds of derisory words if they're gay. All of that is the science that goes on in education institutions allows children to be bullied. It allows them by not naming it and by not providing safe spaces. You must provide safe spaces in education for people to name their difference in a way where they can be respected. I don't care what class you do it in, whether it's a religion or CPSE or wherever, we have to find that space. Because without it, I think a lot of children at that personal level would drop out of school, even regardless of economic circumstances. And I would say this is the thing I've said again ad nauseum. There should be a website, an interactive website, and the unions could push the Department of Education to, this to address the information deficit. And a lot of people simply do not know how education works. I mean, I was astounded. We did a study of maths teaching in 2002, and we interviewed a lot of parents for that study. And one of the things that really shocked me is a lot of people did not know the difference between foundation, ordinary, and higher level subjects. One of the parents told me, oh, my job is doing fine. I said, what are they doing? And they got an A in, in foundation maths. Foundation maths doesn't allow you to enter any course in higher education. But the parent was never told. And I think that's very serious. And schools, I think, have a moral responsibility to tell parents. If you do an ordinary level, it has the most points, six ordinary level subjects. The most points you can get in four, six A points is 360 points. Or we learn subjects. Well, when we introduced the special access program in UCD, everybody was astounded we weren't getting that many applications. I said, did you ask the schools how many students are doing higher level subjects? Virtually nobody was doing higher level subjects in many years. So if you're not doing higher level subjects, you weren't in the race. So I think that there is an information deficit. And parents, unless you're an insider in education, you've been in the education system, you know. And I would say very strongly to the professionals, I believe they are monopolizing that knowledge and they are not letting it out there because it would make life more difficult for the Department of Education and for schools. Okay. But sorry, that's my opinion. And I 
said there are models of good practice. Some schools are excellent. They are absolutely excellent models of good practice in relation to everything. They have, you know, great education programs. They have uh, addressing difference. They do inform parents. They do inform children of their education choices and their education other structure. I do believe that you should be a form and mechanism for actually giving that information around. And what I'm saying here is professionals need to address their own fears. Because I think people are very fearful. Teachers are fearful. They fear they're being attacked. Uh, you know, school principals are fearful. Parents are fearful. And we need to talk about the fear. What are we afraid of if we surveyed the children at school? What are we afraid of if we gave the parents information? You know, what are we afraid of? And maybe we need to address that problem. I'm not blaming people because I think an awful lot of teachers work extremely hard. They do their best. But there is a need to address internally as a profession their own fears. And <coughs> I've said this again, repeating it. Include grassroots working class people, farmers and new communities and others, women's groups, whatever they are, in developing education services. The politics of presence. Don't design services for people. Nothing, the disability movement had a great phrase, nothing about us without us. Nothing about us without us. And I think that is, should be the policy in fact. The other point I make about schools, and I think this is very serious actually in schools, more serious actually across Europe where I've been working a lot with people from France and Germany even than in Ireland, we still try to use traditional authority. Like I always say, you know what, often, sorry, you won't mind me saying this, but you do know a teacher. They come to you like this and they say, now, I told you. And that is authority. It's the exercise of traditional authority. You know, I'm an authority, I know what you do. And I think that schools and teachers need retraining in service education, support, in begin dialoguing and in doing education differently. And I don't have time to address this, it's something I've written about at length, but I think it is very serious. We need democratic forms of authority. Not least because most young people in schools won't accept it for no other reason than that. We know that half the secular students in Ireland have jobs, right? And if you have a job, whether it's an open supermarket or wherever it is, you are treated as an adult, you're expected to turn up, do the job, etc. And you go into school then, and you're expected to say yes or no, sir, anything you say, sir, to somebody who is boring you to tears. <laughs> well, that's a fact. It's true. it's true. So why should you? And I'm just saying that we need to have a dialogue about that. I'm not blaming people. I'd say we need to have a dialogue and we need in-service education. I would say we need a lot of retraining, rethinking, and going back to what I said about the intellectuals. We need to recognize this is an intellectual issue, an intellectual problem as to how we teach and how we relate to people and how we understand them. Grouping students. I feel, again, I know this is people who tell me this is a function of the way things are done in school. You have higher and ordinary subjects, you have to go to students. Some schools do and some don't. In fact, girls' schools disproportionately do not do it. So that's a fact. They are far less likely to group students by so-called ability. I'm very opposed to it and always have been because I think what happens is, especially in first and second year, you label children and you literally define them as lesser or greater. But I'm not I'm denying the fact there is an issue. But the point I want to make here is the grouping of children by academic ability is virtually non-existent in a lot of the feedback schools. So I ask you, why is that, do you think? I know why it is, because parents who pay the fees for the child to go from feedback school will not accept that their children are going to be classified as lesser or greater. Now don't tell me you don't have plenty of children who have no interest in school in feedback schools. You do. You do, actually. And the results actually show us if you can take control for intake, as you know, there are no difference between those schools and, and other schools in general. But the problem with that is you end up in the low tracks with children who are often minor in disabilities, children with um, working class backgrounds, young men disproportionately in mixed schools, boys are more likely to be in those streams, travellers, and new communities. So you end up classifying and putting those who are already disadvantaged into a more disadvantaged position. And again, 
This debate has almost dropped off the edge. Nobody talks about it. But it is a serious way in which inequality is introduced in education. And then what happens is you're more likely to do ordinary or foundation, and that automatically excludes you from any areas of higher education. So that's a fact. And as I said, parents are often not informed. So I think that's a very serious, one very specific thing that people could address. Finally, I want to finish here talking about commercialization. We are facing a major challenge to public education. There's no question about that. Uh, it is going to, it is going on, and there's a major move to privatize higher education. It's very, very serious to make it commercial. And then what's behind it is neoliberal capitalism, which is, of course, about taking out uh, uh, public services from the public purse and putting them on the private market. Putting education on the private market is a serious, serious problem. Because once you do that, it's no longer a right, it becomes something, a consumer product that you buy. And I'm just saying, but well, education is a right. You need it to realize other rights. So I think whatever else we do, if we're talking about change or bringing about greater equality, we have to fight against commercialization of education. I've come to that. It's a very serious problem in higher education at the moment. Um, so what do I conclude? To have substantive equality in education requires structural adjustments inside and outside of education. It requires us to reduce income and wealth inequalities because they impact directly on our participation and success in education. And the inside of fear of failing among the relatively secure that keeps the poor in their place. And I think that's actually what happens. It isn't just that you know, certain children don't do well. Children whose parents fear they're going to lose out become more competitive and introduce new barriers, and they gradually increase the state's rise, as we know. Increasingly now you have to have not just a degree, but a master's degree to get something. So actually what happens, when you have a very economically unequal society, people become more fearful and become, quite frankly, more vicious and more competitive. And <coughs> I've always argued that in a globalised world, you have, should have a, a human right to third level education. The reason is because Irish people used to emigrate with a shovel. And as I said, when I was an immigrant in the 1970s, there were many people who had no third level education. They did the worst jobs in the worst places. So I believe in a globalized world, especially that I'm not a condoning, I think immigration is an incredible injustice. I've been really strongly about it as my own children face it at the moment. But if they are to immigrate, or wherever they are, they should have the right to third level education. It's no longer an option of extra. And and I think that the social cultural practices can exacerbate, but I also believe that schools and professions can actually bring about change. And I'm just saying that I don't believe you can have equality of opportunity without economic equality. And finally, I just want to say this. You might be able to read these, but I'll tell you what's in them. Just be aware when we talk about who's poor, that who's poor is not necessarily you know, there's an image of people who are working class that's going out with the kind of sandwiches under your arm and a shovel over your back, a blue collar worker. Uh huh. <coughs> Wrong image. Parenting alone. People who are parenting alone. And people who are unemployed. And people who are disabled. Those three groups, lone parents, unemployed, or disabled, are the groups that are most at risk of poverty in the country. And we know that some of the cuts lately in the budget actually affect people who are parenting in home very badly. So I'm just saying, working class, or really defined in terms of working class, is not a homogenous group. Many people are in poor situations and can't avail of education who come to those positions via other statuses, in particular their care status has a major impact on whether or often you're able to take a job or you can even afford the childcare to take a job. And parenting in home is a huge factor. Nationalities other than people in Irish, people who are not homeowners, uh, uh, people who, um, who, who are working solely at home, people who are not employed. So I'm just saying, and of course, children have a higher probability by far of being poor than their parents. 20% of children, and if you go back to male or female, 16, 17%. 
So I'll just say, when we do talk of inequality, we must recognise the diversity of groups uh, that suffer inequality the most. So thank you very much for your attention. And I